In this video, I'm going to be building a decision tree classifier from scratch in Python. So no scikit-learn, just a pure mathematical implementation built from the ground up. Hey everyone, I'm Harry and this is episode 5 of the Machine Learning from Scratch series, where I'm sharing my process as I work through implementing classic machine learning models from zero. Let's get straight to it. A decision tree is a binary tree, meaning each node can have a maximum of two child nodes that recursively splits a dataset into increasingly pure subsets called leaf nodes. That is, they contain data points that are mostly from a single class. For example, suppose we have this dataset which gives us data about the age of a customer, their income, and whether or not that customer will buy a product. A trained decision tree to predict whether or not a customer will buy the product might look something like this. The very top of the tree is is known as the root node and represents the entire data set. The first split happens here. In this case, we ask if age is less than or equal to 30. If the answer is yes, we follow the left branch. And if the answer is no, we follow the right branch. Following the left branch, we arrive at the next node. This is called a decision node because just like the root node, which is simply the very first and most important decision node, it's a point in the tree where the data is split again based on a feature condition. In this case, is income less than or equal to 50,000. Again, depending on the answer, we follow either the left or the right branch until we eventually reach a leaf node. The leaf nodes are the endpoints of the tree. In our example, they're completely pure, meaning all the data points inside them belong to the same class, so there's no need to split any further. A new data point or customer that ends up reaching this leaf node would simply be predicted to buy the product because all the training examples in that node belong to the buy class. Now, in larger data sets, it's not always possible or or even desirable for every leaf node to be completely pure. If we force the tree to keep splitting until each leaf had only one class, the model could become too complex and end up overfitting the training data. So instead, we typically stop when the leaf is sufficiently pure, or when other stopping criteria are met, and the prediction is made using majority voting. The leaf simply assigns the class that appears most often among the samples in that node. But how do we actually build a decision tree from a dataset? How does the tree know which feature to split on at each node and what value to split at. The key idea is that we want to split the data such that the resulting subsets are as pure as possible, meaning each subset contains mostly one class. Two popular ways to measure the impurity in a node are entropy and Gini impurity. Entropy is a measure of the randomness or uncertainty. High entropy indicates the node has a high degree of disorder or uncertainty, and low entropy indicates a high degree of certainty, i.e. the node mostly contains a single class. To calculate the entropy as a node, we sum from i equals 1 to the number of classes c of negative pi multiplied by the log of pi, where pi is the probability of class i, or in other words, the proportion of samples in class i for this node. For our previous example, at the root node, the probability that a customer buys the product is 0.5, and the probability that they don't buy is also 0.5. If we just plug in these values, we find that the root node's entropy is 1, which is the highest possible value of entropy. This makes sense because we're completely uncertain which class a new customer belongs to before making any splits. Additionally, notice that if we calculate the entropy for this leaf node here, we get 0, the minimum entropy, since it's a completely pure node, so there's no uncertainty about what class it could be. On the other hand, Gini impurity measures impurity as the probability that a randomly chosen instance in a data set will be misclassified. Just like entropy, the lower the Gini value, the purer the node. A Gini of 0 means the node is completely pure, while higher values mean the node is more mixed, with samples spread across multiple classes. The formula for Gini is as follows, where again, pi is the probability of class i. Once we have a measure of impurity, either entropy or Gini impurity, we can figure out the best feature and threshold value to split on using something called information gain. Information gain is simply the reduction in impurity that results from making a split. We compare how impure the parent node is before the split to the impurity of the child nodes after the split. Note, since the child nodes may contain different numbers of samples, we calculate a weighted average of their impurities. This ensures that the contribution of each child node to the total information gain is proportional to the number of examples it contains. 
The algorithm tries all possible features and thresholds at each node, calculates the information gain for each potential split, and then chooses the split that gives the highest information gain. This is the one that leads to the greatest reduction in uncertainty, moving us toward purer child nodes. By repeating this process recursively, splitting the dataset, checking impurities, and choosing the split with the best information gain, we keep building the tree until we reach leaf nodes, either because the node is pure or because a stopping criteria criteria is reached. Alright, now let's get to coding it up. So the first thing that I'm going to do is import the libraries we'll need. NumPy for any numerical calculations we might use, Pandas just to load the data set, and Scikit-learn just to split the data into a training set and a testing set. Everything else, the actual decision tree, will be built entirely from scratch. We're also going to need Python's built-in counter class from the collections module, which will later help us perform majority voting by selecting the most common class label when assigning a prediction to a leaf node. Next, I'll load in the data we'll be using. The dataset we're using for this is the Irish species dataset available from Kaggle. It's a multi-class classification dataset where each example is a flower described by a number of features like petal length and petal width. The target variable is the species labeled as either Setosa, Versicolor or Virginica. I'll go ahead and pull out these input features and labels now as NumPy arrays. Here X will contain the input feature values for each flower. This doesn't include the ID and target species column, so we drop these from this. And Y contains the actual species class labels for each example, an array of elements that are either Setosa, Versicolor, or Virginica. Once we have these, I'll go ahead and split this data up into a training set and a testing set using an 80-20 split. With that set up, let's get started. I'll first define a node class to describe the nodes of our decision tree via several attributes. Each node in our decision tree can either be a decision node or a leaf node. If it's a decision node, it needs to store things like the index of the feature we split on, the threshold value, the information gained for that split, and links to its left and right child nodes so we can easily move from parent nodes to child nodes when making a prediction for a new data point. If it's a leaf node, then it just stores the final majority class value, which will be the predicted class for any data point reaching this leaf. Now let's move on to defining the main decision tree class. This is where we'll implement the logic to build the tree, find the best splits and make predictions. When initializing the class, we we'll set the minimum number of samples required at a node to consider splitting it further and the maximum depth of the tree. I'll use default values of 2 for both min samples split and max depth. These act as stopping conditions to prevent the tree from splitting forever and overfitting. The init method simply stores these values. Next, I'll define the most important function of this class, the build tree function. This is a recursive function that's going to take in the dataset for the current node. At the start, that's the full training dataset, but each time we split, the recursive calls for the left and right child nodes get just the left and right subsets of the data respectively. I'll also pass in the current depth, which defaults to zero at the root of the tree. Inside, I'll first separate the dataset for the current node into its input input features and labels. So X will be all the columns except the last one, and Y will be the last column, which is the target class labels for our dataset. Next, I'll extract the number of samples and number of features at our current node using X.shape. Now let's add the stopping condition. We should only continue to split the tree if the number of samples at this node is greater than or equal to the minimum samples required for a split, and if the current depth hasn't exceeded the maximum depth. If that's true, we get the best possible split for this data by calling a method I will define shortly called best split. This will need to take in the current data set and the number of features we could split on. Before we go ahead and use this best split to create child nodes, let's check if it actually improves the model. The best split method will return a dictionary containing information about the split, like feature index, threshold, left and right data sets, and the information gain. If the information gain for this best split is greater than zero, it means this split helps reduce impurity in the node, so we use it. If the information gain was equal to zero, we'd be trying to split a node that's already pure, which doesn't make sense. If that's satisfied, we can build the left and right child nodes by recursively calling this function on the left and right subsets of the dataset that came from this best split, and we increase the current depth by one each time. So first, it will fully build out the left child node, continuing to create all descendant nodes under it until it hits a stopping condition or leaves, and then it will 
do the same for the right child node. Finally, I'll return the decision node that stores all of the information about the current split, such as the feature index, threshold, left and right child nodes we just built, and the information gain. But if the node doesn't meet the splitting conditions, either it has too few samples, we've reached the maximum depth, or no split improves the information gain, then we stop splitting and make it a leaf node. I'll look at the class labels in the dataset at this node and pick the most common one. The majority class becomes the final predicted value stored at this leaf, and we return that here. As it's a leaf node, we only need to pass the final majority class value attribute. After this, let's define the best split function, which is responsible for finding the optimal feature and threshold to split the dataset at the current node in order to maximize information gain. As you've already seen in the build tree function, best split is going to return a dictionary containing all the relevant information about the best split we find. So I'll first initialize that here. The dictionary will store the feature index, threshold, left and right subsets of the dataset, and the information gain for the best split we find. Initially, all values are set to none or negative one for the information gain, because we haven't evaluated any splits yet. Next, I'll loop over each possible feature we could split on at this node. For each feature, I'll get all unique feature values in that column and use them as potential threshold values to try by calling mp.unique. Each unique value becomes a candidate threshold for the current feature that we'll test to see how well it splits the dataset. For each candidate threshold, I'll call a helper splits method, which I'll define shortly. This takes in the dataset along with the current feature and threshold to split on and simply divides the dataset into a left subset containing all samples where the feature value is less than or equal to the threshold and a right subset containing all samples where the feature value is greater than the threshold. Once we have the left and right subsets, I'll first check if both of them contain at least one sample. If either subset is empty, this threshold isn't a valid split, so we we'll skip it. If both subsets have samples, I'll extract the target labels from the parent dataset, the left and right child subsets. Subsets. Using these, I can compute the information gain of this split by calling an information gain method, which I will define very soon as well. This compares how impure the parent node is before the split to the impurity of the child nodes after the split, so it needs these labels as inputs. If the information gain for splitting on the current feature and threshold is greater than the best information gain we found so far, that means the current split is better than any we've seen before. In that case, I'll update the best split dictionary with this feature's index, its threshold, the left and right datasets from the split, and the new best information gain. This process repeats for every feature and every unique threshold for that feature, so by the end of the loops, best split will contain the feature and threshold that produce the highest information gain for this node. Finally, I'll return the best split dictionary so that the build tree function can use it to create the left and right child nodes. With that done, let's now define the split and information gain functions that were used in best split. I'll start with the split helper method. This function is responsible for dividing the dataset at the current node into two subsets based on the current feature and threshold value we're testing. Inside, I'll use a simple list comprehension to separate the rows of the dataset. For the left subset, I'll include all rows where the value in the chosen feature column is less than or equal to the threshold. For the right subset, I'll include all rows where the feature value is strictly greater than the threshold. Notice I've converted both into NumPy array so they're consistent with the rest of our implementation. Finally, I'll return both the left and right subsets here. Now let's define the information gain function, which measures how much a given split reduces the impurity. As we saw earlier, it takes in three arguments, the target labels from the parent dataset and the labels from the left and right subsets after the split. Inside, I'll first calculate the relative sizes of the left and right subsets compared to the parent, which I'll call the weights. To calculate information gain, gain, I'll start by computing the entropy of the parent node, which measures how impure the dataset is before the split. Then I'll subtract the weighted average of the entropies of the left and right child subsets, which represents the impurity after the split. This directly follows the formula we looked at earlier. It's worth noting that instead of entropy, I could have used the Gini index as the impurity metric. The calculation would be identical in structure, except I'd call a Gini function in place of the entropy function. Both give very similar splits and wouldn't significantly change the overall tree. Finally, I'll return this information gain value so that the best split function can use it to compare candidate splits. Next, let's define the entropy function that we've been using. This computes the impurity of a node by taking in the set of 
target labels Y for that node. I'll start by initializing entropy to zero and then loop over all unique class labels in Y, which we get using mp.unique. For each class, I'll calculate the proportion of samples that belong to that class. In other words, the probability of that class. I can then add the negative of this probability multiplied by the base two log of the probability to the total entropy. This follows directly from the formula we saw earlier. After looping through all classes, entropy contains the total impurity for that node, and I'll return it here. Okay, so at this stage, we've built all the core functions required for constructing the tree. And now we can move on to the methods that actually let us interact with it, training it on data and making predictions. First, let's define the fit method. This is what we call to train the decision tree on our training data. So it's going to take in the training input features X and target labels Y. First, I'll concatenate these X and Y to create a single data set, which makes it easier to pass around during recursive splitting in the build tree function. Then we call build tree on this data set to start building the tree from the root. Since each node object contains links to its left and right children, and those children in turn link to their own children recursively, storing just the root is enough to represent the entire tree's structure. Now we'll implement the predict method. This is going to take in our numpy array of new data points x and return an array of predicted class labels for each row. So inside this method, we'll create a list comprehension stored as predictions that loops over each new point in the array of new points and calls a method I'll define shortly called predict class on the current new point, passing in the row of data and the root node of the tree. After collecting all predictions in the list, we can return it here. Lastly, let's define the predict class method, which takes a single new data point row and recursively walks down the tree to predict its class label. Inside, we first check if the node has a value. If it does, that means it's a leaf node, so I return that value as the predicted class. Otherwise, the current node we're on is a decision node. So I'll get the feature value from the row corresponding to this node split and use it to decide whether to follow the left or right child. If the value is less than or equal to the node's threshold, I recursively call predict class on the left child node. If it's greater, I'll recursively call it on the right child node. This continues until we reach a leaf, which gives the final predicted class for that row. Now that we're done, let's go ahead and run it. I'll create an instance of our decision tree model and call the fit method with our training data, which is going to build our tree starting from the root. I can then use this trained model to generate predictions on new unseen examples by calling the predict method on the test set. Comparing these predictions to the actual labels in Y test gives me the testing accuracy, and I'll print that out here. And there we go, we get an accuracy of 96.67%. And if you're curious what the tree actually looks like to make these predictions, it's possible to add a print tree function to the class. Calling the one I just made on our data gives me the following output, which provides a visual sense of how the model is classifying the examples behind the scenes to arrive at this accuracy. If you found this video helpful, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. Thank you so much for watching.